Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Pamela Hastings, and welcome to another Barometer webcast. It is the middle of August, and joining me today is David Burrows, our Chief Investment Strategist and President here at Barometer Capital. Um, today, we're going to do a brief review of current market and economic conditions. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burrows. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. It's nice to see your face. Thank you. Uh, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad there's a bunch of people who are able to sign on today. <clears throat> Here we are, it's the middle of August. Uh, we are in kind of the, the doldrums of summer. Uh, and you would think that there's not very much going on, but there, you know, there's, there's lots of things for us to be focused on. And uh, what I thought I'd do today is just kind of do a quick review of kind of where things stand, where we see opportunities, things we're, we're continuing to be cautious about, uh, and, and some of the things that we're thinking about uh, in the portfolios. So, um, you know, clearly uh, everybody has an approach and, and we have ours. And so I always look at things through our lens. Uh, and um, uh, as most people know, we sort of believe that our job is to use the tools that we have to try and target the key themes in the market that are seeing that inflows of capital, uh, sectors or themes that are benefiting from structural shifts. Uh, we are not trying to be everywhere. Anybody can go out and buy an S&P 500 uh, unit for almost nothing. Uh, but then, of course, you live with the volatility and you have to drag along some of the underperformers. Um, so in our world, we think we got to do three basic things. Uh, we're always focused in our work and in the process that we follow every day in to try to identify market leadership themes. And those can be sectors, it could be geographic regions, it could be asset classes, and it changes over time. Sometimes it's persistent, and sometimes there's lots of rotation, so we've always got to be watching. Can't read about that in the newspaper. And so we use our tools to try and recognize change before it's obvious. Uh, and it often, you know, comes in phases. And then there are some times, which we've all been through, where nothing's working, and our process is really focused on uh, getting to the sidelines if things get sloppy uh, or if there is no clear leadership and the risk reward just isn't in our favor. So, uh, you know, I think that most of you know, this is quite a tactical approach to things. And we have a set of steps that we walk through every day, a set of rules that we follow. And in the investment team, uh, everybody has, uh, has steps to take. Um, so we've talked for some time about the fact that we exited a secular bear market in 2013 for stocks. Uh, and at that time, uh, markets started to rally, took out the highs from 2000. And we've been working our way higher since then, uh, now going on seven years. And there have been interruptions, some big ones in 2015, 16, and certainly 2018 was a rotten one. And, and the worst one, of course, was, was this winter uh, driven by the pandemic. NASDAQ, different than the S&P, took much longer to come out of its bear market peaked in 2000 and didn't make a new high again until 2016, 16 years later. And if we went around the world, we'd find that, that the S&P really was the first of the major equity markets to make a new high and kick off a, a secular or structural bull market. And, and there are some markets today that still have not come out of long sideways uh, corrective uh, consolidations that they've been in for a long time, specifically Japan and, and some others. So we're always trying to focus on the strength. And, uh, and so this drives us more to the US than anywhere else. Uh, and this has been sort of a theme for us for several years. We went through that waterfall decline, which was rotten uh, from, uh, from uh, middle of February through the end of March. I think it was a, a 33 day bear market, the fastest bear market in history. Uh, this plots it against every bear market going back to 1927. So you can see clearly it was an outlier driven by different sorts of factors. And since then, remarkably, the market has worked its way back higher. And here we sit more or less sort of at the old highs, which is amazing. It actually makes it uh, the, the, the strongest equity recovery in the last 40 years. And I think if any of us had been sitting here in March, we would have thought there was going to be a lot of uh, backwards and forwards and ups and downs. And we've had some small pullbacks along the way, but clearly the combination of sort of Fed response uh, stimulus uh, and fiscal stimulus um, has, has helped. And, and the hope that is out there for 
therapeutics and vaccines that can pull us out of this, this difficult situation. But certainly lots of things still to worry about. Even the fastest recoveries in history have had pretty significant pullbacks along the way. So I don't think that we're going to be immune to that. But thank goodness for the process that we're using because it sort of kept us focused uh, in some of these themes that have been working. When I last did this call, we missed last week. I took a week at the, at the cottage last week, which was good. Um, we were facing some sloppiness in some of our indicators. A percent of stocks and uptrends in the US had been backing off, meaning the market had been narrowing. And we saw the same thing on the world stage for equities and many of our short-term indicators had been backing off. In the last two weeks, we've seen some improvement. So as of uh, today, our key model for the US stock market uh, is firming, um, not without some basic flaws. There are some small chinks in the armor in, uh, in the short-term indicators. The, the global breadth indicator, which we look at as sort of assessing the flow of funds, you know, continues to be sort of sloppy. So the US continues to be the leader. Uh, and within the US, there are some pretty clear themes that we've been focused on. Percent of stocks um, uh, globally uh, in uptrends uh, uh, has been falling and sitting at 48%. So just less than 50% of the stocks globally are, in, are performing well. When we look at the US stock market, one of the things that we're a little bit concerned about is that uh, at the end of June, when sort of beginning of June, when markets were making their highs, 96% um, of stocks had an upward trajectory or were upward price movement. And as we sit today, it's about 68%, so fewer. Um, but that has been in general improving over the last few weeks. If we take other global markets, a little different than, than the S&P, uh, this is the Euro stocks 50, which is made up of 50 of the major stocks throughout Europe. We can look at the DAX, uh, which is the German index or the French index. They look uh, quite similar. Uh, made highs in June, are yet to make a new high since then, uh, have sort of been consolidating. And you know, markets correct two ways. They correct in time, which means they chop sideways, or they correct in price. We prefer to see markets correct over time. Uh, and, and you know, we'll see whether we see a reacceleration there. The Japanese stock market, which is one of the ones I was referring to earlier, this is a picture of the Japanese stock market back to going into this bear market back in 1990-91, and basically has been in a trading range ever since. Uh, but in the most recent sell-off has made back most of what has been given up. I'll be anxious to see it at some point take out these highs because generally when a structural bull market starts, it could go on for 15 or 18 years. So the S&P, we're seven years into a bull market. Uh, the NASDAQ, we're really only three years into a new bull market. Uh, I think that they've got a long way to go, uh, but there's going to be some bumpiness along the way and we've got to watch for that. So in Europe, breadth, uh, continues to be a little sloppy in Latin America. Breadth continues to be a little bit sloppy, meaning fewer stocks than in June were performing well. In Asia, it's a similar picture. So we focus in the US. So over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been right in the heart of earnings season. Uh, if we take a look at the S&P 500, 466 of the 500 companies have reported. Uh, average sales growth was down 9.9%, fully expected going in that the numbers were going to be weak. And earnings growth is down 7.66%. Now that varies by sector. You can see energy earnings are down 54%. Um, uh, you can see that industrials earnings down 24%, financials earnings down 26%. So one of the questions might be, well, why is it that the market has sort of taken all of this in stride? And I think part of it is, that the expectations going into the earnings period were so low because it was so little color or visibility as to what companies might report analysts were exceedingly cautious and as we've worked our way through the reports on average companies have beat the estimates from a revenue perspective by 1.6 percent but earnings on the other hand have beaten by 22 percent so this is sort of counterintuitive but the reality is that the S&P 500 looks very little like Main Street USA. Some of the very biggest companies, of course, are world beaters and have had their business models accelerated. So they skew the numbers. But we're seeing companies that we all know, like Nike or Home Depot or Lowe's last night, 
36% year over year revenue growth. Turns out lots of people are doing home improvements. Uh, and, and so there have been some real bright spots and of course some, some rotten ones that's been about picking your spots. Um, we note that while stimulus and monetary policy has been very supportive of markets, since the beginning of June, we've seen a lot less Fed activity. So this is the Fed's purchases in blue of ETFs, which were quite heavy from May through June. They've started to back off, clearly feeling that they need less help uh, than they did to provide liquidity. Bond purchases by the Fed have backed off. So the market is sort of more or less acting without the same kind of training wheels it has had through June. And frankly, the market has handled that quite well. We know investors uh, went from feeling extreme pessimism in February. You know, they're pretty darn euphoric today. So there's a lot of confidence. Uh, private investors are participating in much greater numbers than they have in several years. A year ago, on average, private investors made up about 10% of the average daily traded volume. It's sitting today closer to 30%. So the private investor is engaged and they're engaged in companies that they know. We got to be a little bit careful because we know when people get euphoric, it can have an impact on future returns in the market or it can cause pullbacks. But at this point, certainly there is uh, more optimism. We take that into account. It's a bit of a contrarian indicator. We look at a lot of short-term data and we're in an interesting world today where we can get all kinds of data on different things um, that tell us what's happening almost day by day. We get credit card spending data. Uh, we get data from Google that shows us how many map requests there are um, uh, going on. You can see that that sort of quieted down over the last uh, month, month and a half from an initial big spike. Um, we see data from the TSA in the US, how many people are going through airports. So we're watching all of that. It looks like some of that data may have slowed down through July. There's some indication of maybe reaccelerating in August. And that would make sense that the market has been going through a little bit of indigestion. So getting back to the point, right, where is the leadership? And is there any change taking place? Let's take a look at that. So as you know, um, we try to identify neighborhoods to focus our attention in areas where we see appetite, um, where there is risk acceptance. And we take all of the various geographic regions and sectors and themes uh, and styles that we could focus in and try to drill down to those that are seeing improving breadth where more and more securities are participating. And then we try to express that view in the portfolios by finding securities from within those groups that show us that their financials are improving, where their prices are performing relative to their peers. And as I always talk about, we're trying to find things that are good getting better. Companies that are benefiting from the current environment where they could be revalued versus their peers. And then we run stop losses on the portfolios. So breadth is a basic concept, but as you bottom in a sector or a theme, a few of the strongest stocks perform well at the beginning, and then the buying spreads to more and more securities, and that's healthy, that's, that's a bull market. Uh, when you start to see deterioration in breadth, it doesn't mean that, it has to, that everything is gonna get hurt within that bucket, but it does mean that the risk gets elevated, which is why we stayed away from Europe and we stayed away from Asia. With it, X, X China, which is a small piece, um, and, and focused in areas where we're seeing expanding breadth. So a few key things. We've talked about this over the last few weeks. US dollar has continued to weaken versus the basket of world currencies. Now that has an impact on the very biggest companies, especially those that sell stuff overseas, makes US goods more attractive and more competitive. And so that's been good for the S&P 500 and good for some of the big NASDAQ stocks not so good for some of the smaller companies which have been underperforming. Let's talk sectors. I get a little bored talking about this, but technology just continues to chug along. So on the light blue line here at the bottom of the screen is the relative price performance versus the S&P. So if that line is rising, it means that prices are outperforming the S&P and technology led going into the decline they led going through the decline and they lead on the other side. So as you know, this has been a big area of focus for us. 
semiconductors are a great example. But we know we have to be a little careful here because the top five stocks make up an inordinate amount of the index. In the NASDAQ 100, 55% of the NASDAQ 100 is five stocks. And that compared to what was going on in 2000 with Microsoft, GE, Cisco, Intel, and Walmart, you know, dwarfs that. So while this is an important area for us, we have to be careful not to be too overweight, whether we want to or not, because at the end of the day, if we get some big disappointments, that could have a really negative impact. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But semiconductors just continue to perform well. Basic building block goes into everything. Certainly we have uh, the 5G movement coming towards us where everything ultimately winds up connected to the internet. Uh, and so the companies that make equipment and the companies that produce chips, uh, especially the leading ones like NVIDIA <clears throat> are, are really benefiting. Software stocks have consolidated a little bit over the last month, but basically sitting on the highs uh, and we've, we've had good exposure there. Goals. We talked about goals as, as being a really key theme for us. It's, it's, it's one that, frankly, we've avoided for a long time, but over the last year, it really is a place to be focused. Uh, pulled back a little bit over the last 10 days. It was one quite bad day last week. People might have noticed portfolios pulled back a little bit. Very normal thing to have happen. It was about a five-day pullback, about a 12-day 12, 12 pullback uh, back in February when the, when the big sell-off came, but very quickly reversed. It pulled back about 10% from the highs back into the moving averages at this point continues to look very constructive because we've only just taken out the highs from 2011. And as we've talked about, the gold stocks have underperformed the gold itself until recently. So we think we're at the early days of performance from gold and silver miners, large, intermediate, and small. Now, when we talk about secular themes, We've talked about equities being in a secular bull market, multi-year bull market for many years, but commodities have been in a bear market. And uh, gold was the first group within the commodity complex to turn, but we're now seeing additional groups join that rally, like copper, for instance, the base metals producers. And we talked a little bit about some of the very large ones, Rio Tinto, after going sideways for many years, has recently made a new high and has started the early stages, we think, of quite a promising move higher. So we have been building exposure in the basic materials and we'll see that in the holdings. Healthcare, which has been a staple for us, continues to perform well. Move sideways over the last month, but today actually coming out and making a new high. Uh, biotech also has been consolidating uh, and some of the service providers but again, remains quite strong. Consumer discretionary has been a standout. Now this is a little bit misleading maybe because this is an ETF VCR, which holds consumer discretionary companies based on their market cap or their size, which of course Amazon is the biggest. And so it has been a big, big contributor here. But it's not just the uh, internet retailers and this is the ETF which expresses a basket of all the internet related companies um, like Amazon, but also the home builders and suppliers into home improvement. And we talk about north of 30% year over year uh, traffic growth at Home Depot and at Lowe's. And certainly this is a theme that, that people are taking that discretionary spend and spending it to improve their homes. Industrials over the last couple of weeks had a nice lift. And this is after consolidating for a few weeks. And, and it's not everything. Certainly robotics have been a theme for us along the way and automation. Companies benefiting from a structural shift to a little bit less labor, uh, but also the transport stocks, in particular, the railroads, which we've talked about on recent calls, CP and, and uh, Kansas City Southern, but also companies around the whole transport and logistics, which we've also been talking about. Uh, most recently in the last week, both UPS and FedEx have had a very good move higher. And they're announcing price increases. Now let's go to the other side. The bond market has been going through a very interesting period. When bond prices move higher, of course, that means yield is moving lower. So this is a, an ETF that holds 20 to 30 year treasury bonds in the US. 
We had a spike higher when the, when the sell-off first began. And then when the Fed stepped in and started to stimulate, we had bonds rally again, but to a lower high. They pulled back. And then as people thought there might be uh, some, what they call yield curve control by the Fed, meaning that they would work to not just hold short-term interest rates down, but to hold long-term interest rates down as well, to really give us no other option than to buy stocks. Um, started to back off over the last week or so. Today, the Fed made a very interesting comment saying that they've been studying the idea of yield curve control and feel that it may have an undue impact on the size of their balance sheet, which as we know has been growing rapidly. So this is gonna be interesting because some of the sectors that are more interest rate sensitive have been underperforming and are sectors that we've been avoiding. So things like REITs, this is an index of the REITs uh, in Canada. And you can see that it remains 26% below the highs from February. Uh, so it's been rallying, but it's been a significant underperformer. And this has been a group that we moved away from quite some time ago and were pretty reticent about going back. Now, impacted by office demand, impacted by probably delinquencies, uh, but this is a group that would be hurt if rates went higher. Utilities have been relatively underperforming, making a relative low versus the S&P. Uh, this is an index of the highest dividend payers in the Canadian market. So this would be a group that we would compare our high income mandate to because this is equities that people are buying specifically for the dividend or the higher dividends. And we've talked a little bit about the fact that we think that we're in a world where we want dividend growth because that would offset the risk of rising interest rates. And those are performing better than the high dividend pairs, which are still about 21% off the highs. Energy, energy continues to be tough. Down 40% now over the last 169 days. Made a couple of attempts to get going. And there are some small islands of strength, but this is in general a group that continues to lag. So as I pointed out uh, to a lot of folks over the last week or so, the stay at home stocks are behaving a lot better than the back to work stocks. And we are focused in good getting better as opposed to broken getting fixed. And this has been an important driver for us. If you look at the source of return, groups like technology up 21% on the year, data processing and payments processing group up 20%, consumer discretionary up 18%. We have good strength here, some real weakness on the other side. So this has really been a market where targeting has been important and I think it likely is gonna to continue to be. Now we've been putting this up weekly. This shows the change in holdings that we've been making week by week and technology across the firm continues to be the largest weight. We did take it down somewhat about three weeks ago uh, in and around the earnings period, just because we felt the risks are getting higher. And because frankly, there were some other things to do in industrials. Uh, materials has really been performing well, and that's made up of, of course, precious metals and also base, base metals. Uh, healthcare, we've taken up a little bit more recently after it consolidated for a month. Financials are a significant underweight to the index, uh, and we've continued to underweight them. We moved that weighting a little lower again over the last week. Consumer discretionary uh, and consumer staples, or the consumer, continues to be a sizable piece. Now, I wanted to touch on the income portfolio today. Um, because this is a place where, you know, you can see the value of targeting. Uh, we can be anywhere in the strategy. It's all about finding income producing securities that are good getting better. Uh, we can be in bonds. We can be in corporate bonds. Now the yields are exceedingly low and we think there are risks if rates go higher to those. Uh, so we're a little careful there. Preferred shares are similar. We talked a little bit about REITs today. So you can see probably more focused in dividend paying common shares. And that mix has changed quite a lot along the way. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a strategy that's really worked well versus our benchmark, which is 50% the bond market and 50% uh, the equity income universe. As we sit, no surprise, technology is our largest weight. Um, we are focused within technology more in dividend payers, like for instance, a Microsoft has been very strong from a dividend growth perspective. Uh, we have a good sized weight in materials. The in investment funds is a small exposure to our music royalties 
uh, product, which is giving us very steady cash flows month by month with no market impact. Uh, financials make up about 9% and consumer and industrials. So when we look through the list, uh, there's some companies that certainly you're going to recognize. Uh, Apple has been a great performer. Adobe, from a software perspective, been very, very strong. The video game companies generating very strong growth through the course of COVID. Uh, Facebook has been a real go-to for companies to be able to set up their own uh, store sites and to advertise. LAM Research and the semiconductors, MasterCard and the payments companies, NVIDIA and so on. This is really a core weighting, and it's one that continues to generate returns. On the materials side, the gold's largely mid and large cap, uh, Agnico Eagle, Franco Nevada, which is a nice dividend growth stock, and, and Kinross, we talked a little bit about Rio Tinto today, uh, and then some, some um, uh, uh, Sherwin-Williams, which is really from the home improvement sector. So still a very targeted portfolio, uh, one that we expect will generate north of 10% dividend growth as we move forward. And we think that does well if we see rising rates. So this is important. And I keep going back to this slide because for as an income investor, the fact that we are at rates not seen since the late 1940s, just before we made a turn higher, is significant. When we went through that period from 1951 to 1966, rates went higher all the way through that piece Stocks went up 15% a year, inflation was 1.6% a year, and bonds gave a 1.6% return or 0% real rate of return. And in our strategy, we've talked a little bit before about the fact that when rates go higher, bond prices go lower, and the strategy's done a pretty good job of generating positive returns. And I'm pretty pleased with how things are going in general. Um, through the decline, we, we gave up well less than half in the dividend payers universe as we sit today, uh, we're down about 5% on the year versus the high dividend paying universe down about 24. Um, so I, I think that it's setting us up well uh, for the slow recovery in the economy that will allow us to generate a rising stream of dividends. So, you know, to summarize, there's some very clear leadership in this market. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of new strength in some of the industrial stocks, in particular the transports and the home builders. Uh, we're seeing um, uh, some groups continue to underperform that we wanna continue to avoid. And so as a result, we're pretty fully invested. Uh, we're very focused in the US. Uh, and from a currency perspective, because of the weak US dollar, we are hedged back to Canadian dollars just to remove the impact of currency, which we think we don't need to take that risk right now. Now, we watch every day, and every day on our morning meeting at eight o'clock, good half of the conversation is about what could go wrong? What are the things that we worry about? I mean, we have to keep in mind we are gonna get more news on vaccines. We're gonna get more news on therapeutics. Sooner or later, the US is gonna get their act together on the next round of stimulus. We have central banks around the world kind of at the ready to provide additional liquidity, which, you know, the old saying, don't fight the Fed. But we know there are going to be some surprises. And if our breadth work starts to get more negative, we'll get more defensive. Uh, we do have that tool in our toolkit. Uh, but for now, uh, we got to enjoy the summer. And uh, we've got to take advantage of the warmth and being able to be outside while we can. Uh, we can worry about COVID all day long, but at the same time, we've got to have some fun. So for me, this is my new puppy, and he spent the week with us at the cottage last week, and, and he just reminds me that there's a lot of good things out there in the world, and, uh, and we're thankful for those. So thanks so much for, for tuning in. Pam, if you've got any questions uh, in the hopper, we're certainly happy to answer them. Thanks, Dave. And uh, Friday is very cute puppy you have there. Glad you can enjoy him. Um, we do have a few questions today, starting with um, one question on our exposure in energy and in what um, and in what areas we're holding energy companies in our portfolios. Right. So our energy exposure remained very, very light. Um, I showed in the income portfolio four and a half percent weight. And so if you look at that, it's really a bit of a chicken uh, position for us. We've got two pipes, Kiera uh, and Pemina pipe, 
which are really their toll roads. Uh, and, and, and while they have marketing businesses that do go up and down with the business cycle, they, they are a pretty steady income producer. We have a little bit of tourmaline, uh, which we think could be going through a turnaround. Um, and, and that's really the extent of it. We own a little bit of uh, Canadian natural resources and a little bit of Suncor, uh, also sort of the biggest and best longest life reserves. Um, they've done a lot of their capital spending uh, already and are now able to kind of reap the cash flow. Both of them reported great numbers on a relative basis to the sector. But <clears throat> in general, we continue to be quite cautious. You know, the sector backdrop is still a little bit questionable. Uh, and at some point we may see them turn. Um, interesting, you know, we spent a lot of the year with exposure to solar uh, because renewable energy, frankly, is way outperforming. And so we've got a little bit more there. Uh, next question, Dave. Can you explain a bit about how our firm hedges against the falling U.S. dollar? Yeah, we, we literally, uh, we buy forward contracts uh, of, for Canadian dollars. So we take the U.S. exposure that we had. So if we had $100 million of U.S. dollar exposure, we buy a futures contract or a forward contract on $100 million to be delivered in the future at a fixed price. And that just reduces the exposure that, that we have to the U.S. dollar. And virtually every one of our pools at this point is hedged 100% back to Canadian dollars um, because the, the, uh, the U.S. dollar does look weak versus all currencies. And, that's, and that happens when, when, you, when you print money like, like crazy. Next question, Dave. Uh, NVIDIA released earnings after the close, and despite the beat, the stock is under pressure after hours. Do you yep. see this as profit-taking? So, so look, we, there are a lot of companies that have, uh, I'm going to see if I can pull up something here. There's a lot of companies that have risk of, you know, having a great number, and then, let's just say here, bring your leadership go to the front. I don't know if I, if you can see this, um, but um, you know there there have been a number of companies that have been weak after the close. Uh, you listen to the uh, the uh, conference call, and uh, and over the next couple of days, you know move move, move higher again. Um, there was a weak close today in the Nasdaq on the fact that the bond market sold off a little bit. That could be having an impact. I'll have to take a look at the, what the details are uh, and touch on that uh, after the fact. But we can come back to whoever's asked the question. Thanks, Dave. Um, absolutely. And uh, we have been getting a few questions regarding um, S&P 500 predictions, whether Trump wins or Biden wins the U.S. election. Um, I, I suppose just in the interest of time, maybe we can, if you wanted to touch base on that, you're welcome to, but perhaps I think that's going to be a, a larger conversation for um, another Wednesday. Yeah, and, and you know, we'll try and address that in, in, in the next call. But realistically, um, social policies aside, uh, Biden will be a tougher ticket for the market if if he if he prevails. I think that there's um, there's lots of reason to want to see that happen. Um, but it's going to have an impact on tax policy. It's going to have a, an impact on regulation. Could have a quite a negative impact on the energy industry. Um, so these are things that we have to be on top of. And remember that, that political input is one input. And there's a lot of inputs. And I still look at the market as a machine and there's a lot of moving parts. And ultimately we want to understand when the flows of funds start to shift. So if we were to see some of the groups show some real weakness, show some early stages of bread deterioration um, as, as uh, the platforms become clearer, then you know, we might look at making some changes. But I think in both cases, whether it's uh, Republicans or Democrats, healthcare is gonna be a place to focus. Um, I think technology is gonna be a place to focus in both cases. We'll have to watch you know, around large cap tech, whether there's any kind of uh, risk of regulatory change. Um, but, you know, there's bound, it's the end of August, there's bound to be a little bit of bumpiness in the market over the next little bit. We'll just see 
how resilient the market is and how well it can take these things in stride. Thanks so much, Dave. That concludes our questions for today. And um, if you have anything further for us to address out there uh, with respect to the audience watching, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, uh, phastings at barometercapital.ca. Um, we're happy to address your questions and we appreciate your time and attention this lovely Wednesday afternoon in Toronto. Everybody enjoy the rest of their summer and, and I'll, we'll be back again next week and, uh, and uh, we'll look, look for any changes that we need to be talking about. So thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Pam.